This morning, I'm talking with Tony Lug, the chairman of Tapper, and I wanted to um, just get a bit of a feel for how Tapper is perceiving the supply chain. I'll just move along there to the first uh, question. Tony, how do you think the supply chains are going to hold up, specifically in the Asia Pacific region, but, but also indeed globally amidst the pressures of COVID-19 and also with the ensuing you know, reactions, and some may say prudent, some may say overreactions and the impacts on the economy that have been forced by various government decision makers to various degrees? Hmm. Okay, it's a good question, Paul. So if we can just start off uh, with China, because I think there's some um, good lessons learned there, Paul. Look, as you know, uh, when the outbreak took place in Wuhan, uh, that ended up a rapid shutdown. And but we saw some of those lessons um, in Italy and then across the rest of Europe and then US. So I think um, uh, there are some lessons that you know, the Europeans and the US could have learned from, uh, from China. I think, I think in some respects, those of us that have been based in Asia Pacific for some time or those who, who live here uh, and have experienced um, the previous uh, pandemics as such, already are probably well rehearsed in, in dealing with these issues. So going back to China, what we saw was a, a rapid control of movement uh, being put into force. Um, and look, in terms of the supply chain, that uh, heavily impacted the supply chain because obviously they wanted to stop people from going from province to province. So what it meant was that, you know, the traditional way of, of transporting, for instance, you know, from Wuhan uh, up to Shanghai or or, or vice versa, you know, because there are some major flows between those two locations. You know, suddenly the uh, ground transportation was brought to uh, to a halt. Now, particularly in China, one one thing that um, we noticed that um, those companies which were SOEs um, were able to uh, operate. Um, more easily. Okay, I wouldn't say freely because um, everyone had the um, harsh restrictions. But they were able to operate um, more freely. Um, but anyway, as time went on, um, obviously uh, with that, am that amount of trucking and uh, uh, logistics being sort of restricted, uh, obviously um, uh, you know companies then had uh, the uh, added uh, requirements to uh, to basically you know either screen their people or some of their staff had been confined to uh, to their homes um, because as we just remember it it broke out just before Chinese New Year right so some of the staff had had traveled home and of course you know when it came to that come back to work period there wasn't sufficient staff and in, in you know not only for manufacturing but also for logistics so what happened was was that uh, we started to see choke points Obviously, the flights were now um, starting to reduce. And look, you know, everything I'm saying now is, 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 is basically being repeated across the world. And that's why I'm saying it's a good case study to base some of the issues going, you know, on around the world now. So uh, some of the things that we saw were that there were delays with customs clearance. Obviously, you know, customs officers uh, had, um, are not immune to, to uh, COVID. Um, and um, so, you know, there was some reduction in staff levels, so it meant that clearance was uh, longer. Uh, and of course, um, it, these started, you know, these, you know, the ocean uh, and as well as the air um, started to basically become uh, choke points where there were, were a massive buildup of um, freight. Sorry to interject there, Tony. That, how much of the problems with the supply chain are going to be or are created by obviously you shut down international passenger movement, um, you shut down a lot of available uh, cargoes. So the disruption to passenger airline, how big an effect is, is the flow on when airlines like Qantas and Singapore are cutting 90 to 95% of their flights and the ones they have, maybe three or four critical flights in the case of Qantas internationally, but what supply is moved by road and ship and what percentage is moved by air and how much is the passenger shutdown having on the supply chain? Yeah. So, yeah, Paul, look, at the, the interesting thing is that, you know, obviously the majority of freight is actually moved by ocean. And then, of course, you have, you're on, you know, your uh, inland or outbound trucking operations. So, of course, those trucking operations came to a halt. And, of course, that led to the buildup. And then the next problem was that even where uh, they had goods to export, um, there were blank sailings. So the blank sailing means that uh, the shipping line has um, basically cancelled the, um, the, the sailing to 
to put it in layman's terms, or the vessel hasn't even called out the port. You know, that was, you know, when you think there were something like uh, 60 blank sailings from Maersk alone, uh, and you and um, those of you who know shipping, you know, Maersk is one of the biggest ocean carriers. Yep. So, of course, then what happened, Paul, that, that had a, a massive knock-on effect, right? So, look, I, you know, even if I want to get goods out, and, and including medical equipment, right, because um, if you look at um, some of the air, rates that spiked you know that was caused by basically companies trying to get ppe uh, items out um, not only for hospitals and uh, medical supplies uh, but you know obviously companies were trying to to do that as well so they could uh, continue to run their operations so you imagine they it, we had a, a perfect storm in the sense that the ocean freight has virtually stopped we have a, a massive uh, choke of of material stuck inside the ports like for instance, refrigerated containers. They had to turn yes. away refrigerated containers, you know, were containing food. So of course, then that led to issues around, um, you know, food security and whether, uh, the, you know, stores could be uh, replenished. What happened was, was that, you know, in the, inside the port, they have a number of points where they can, you know, plug the refrigerated containers in. And of course, they'd run out of uh, capacity there. Yes. Because, you know, it, was, it wasn't being pulled inland. So, look, to go on to the air freight side, what happened on the air freight side then with, you know, the sudden reduction of uh, capacity on, the, on passenger airlines? So, when we travel on an aircraft, you know, obviously there's cargo underneath, right? So, um, it's not just profitability of the flight on passengers. It's also the cargo that's being loaded as uh, what, what they call belly freight. So all of that belly freight capacity uh, disappeared. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, um, look, air, I, I don't think some of the airlines were able to react quick enough in turning some of their aircraft around into um, cargo. So you, I, I think everyone's seen those images where passenger uh, planes suddenly became cargo planes where they were just literally putting the cargo on the seats yes. uh, and trying to get, uh, you know, one-time approvals f uh, for that. And of course, that led to a, a massive spike. You know, some of the air freight rates uh, went up about 6%, which is just unbelievable right but but you know people were paying those rates because they obviously wanted to to get product outside the door and look you know if it, if invariably what you had to do you had to buy that up front yes so you know you were taking a risk right so if you had a manufacturing plant and you were trying to buy that capacity um you would have to buy that capacity and and uh, you have to meet your commitment now if you have a problem getting that through customs or whatever then that's your issue you still need to pay for that uh, that space Yes. So a lot of pressure, a lot of problems around that area. Uh, and, uh, and look, what I've seen and what I've heard is that, um, you know, we've seen uh, maybe not on a, on a similar scale. All right. We've, we've had issues in India. You know, we've seen those uh, reported by members where they, they haven't got the capacity uh, or there are so many restrictions uh, being put into place um, that um, it really has uh, choked up some of the supply chain there. But I think the issue uh, has been, is been trying to get the PPE equipment equipment out. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, organizations have been, uh, been trying to replenish supply chains across um, Europe, right? Well, of course, we now know, right, that, that the majority of manufacturing was closed down for about four weeks in, in Europe. So there was that sort of push and pull. And look, Paul, we have a problem now in, in Europe, right? Especially, you know, going back to the choke point, right? So we have overcapacity uh, where we haven't got the consumption consumer yes. consumption so suddenly now warehouses are, are, are being sourced they you know they're they're um fully utilized right so the risk has been is that you know they've been leaving these products inside containers and and trailers now yes you know when you think of clothing all right so you know has it been stored correctly you know is it is it going to be uh, damp and wet you know, I know the insurers yes. are, are, are extremely worried about what's going to happen when this all reopens. Like electronics, have they been stored correctly? If you look at food, has it been under temperature control? So I think there's going to be a lot of issues there. And of course, we've already had, you know, Tapper itself has already had reports of, you know, warehouse break-ins, theft from the, uh, yes. the, the containers and the trailers. So obviously... Criminal gangs are, are taking, you know, this as an opportunity, right, to to go in and um, obviously optimize or take advantage where they can on this, um, you know, sort of lockdown situation. Yes, and Tony, the obviously the larger countries and the complex countries, many provinces and states, India and um, and Indonesia would be two examples. Philippines mm. as well with complex logistical supply. Obviously, that everything you've talked about there, both on an international and a domestic scale, applies. Plus the 
complex situation. You know, in the yeah. prime example where the states, for want of a better word, have their own laws, even though they're trying to standardise it. There's a lot of complexities there in the bureaucracy. Mm. So, as it pertains to food supply within those large countries, do you think uh, the supply chain will struggle, and thus we'll see escalating civil disobedience and civil unrest? Yes. Uh, so, look, you know, in my you know capacity as Taffer Chairman, right? Um, obviously. Or, you know, we're, we're concerned for uh, transportation of food, okay? You know, because I think the, the, I think the trouble is that the supply chain now is being stretched. Uh, so, you know, if everything I've said, and, uh, as you mentioned, you know, you know the, the capacity issues, right? Uh, you know, the traditional way of shipping things uh, is under stress. Um, you know, if you look at uh, air freight, we can't even air freight it in as we would want without really, uh, you know, killing the margins to such an extent. Uh, that we would have to look for some form of government subsidy, um, and then and then I think the the problem is is that you know we, we can't even distribute some of it. You know we know that uh, there are some logistics companies that have um, uh, their own issues, right? Um, so you know the, the, either the staff are ill, they're asked not to come to work, you know, because they have a cold or or some other uh, element, right, which um, would, could you know could make the rest of the operation vulnerable to um, exposing, yes. um, you know, being exposed to COVID. That's sort of a risk professional. Uh, look, I I personally see that there's a, a high risk of um, you know disorder breaking out. I think we've seen pockets of that around the globe, and certainly you know where, where I've spoken to people in my private capacity, you know that's one of the fears going forward is that you know the situation now is becoming you know worrying. Um, and of course, you know, it, this being cooped up, people are slightly depressed. And of course, the depression uh, can turn into some form of anger. Um, and then, you know, we could we could see that um, manifest its, uh, itself further. And so look, our I real, do see that. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Sorry. Our real fear is uh, even beyond that, you know, when you right, look, yeah. at, look at countries such as Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, areas in southern Thailand, areas of India, where there is a poor community, you might have. 20, 30 people living in a dwelling, um, maybe one, maybe two income earners. So that's where we're really worried about it. But if we're looking forward, my final question is, in the medium to long term, what kind of go forward lessons are there? What sort of changes would we hope to see to make the supply chain more resilient? Are they, are they is it technology? Is it governance? What are you hearing amongst the TAPA professionals? And I'm sure most of these things have been raised before, but probably weren't understood as to how important they were by various government officials and, and various industries and sectors. Where, where are we going to see change after this and what changes are necessary, Tony? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's another good question. And Paul, you know, I, I think that this is, you know, this event is going to change the world because, you know, we, we've seen those uh, drug trials in the US, which uh, look favorable at the moment, uh, although it's definitely not being fully confirmed yet. Uh, but we still uh, have to realize the, uh, the vaccine is, uh, you know, potentially nine to 18 months out. So what it means is that this is a new norm, okay? And it means that we have to start managing this uh, on a day to day basis. So it just means that we're going to have to do things differently uh, in yes. terms of, you know, managing our people in, you know, training the people to, to think differently, right? Because we, we know that this is an invisible enemy, which is actually impacting us. Look, I probably seen and, and some of your listeners have probably also read supply chains will change. And, and I, I do believe they will. I think there'd be a lot of political pressure for supply chains to, uh, to change. So we've seen that in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, the pressure there. Uh, we've seen this with uh, PPE equipment. That I suppose the you know bring it home mentality will uh, continue. So we've seen that in India already, where India have now said that they want to produce farm farmer uh, in their own country and not be reliant on raw material from uh, from other countries. Yes. Um, so look, I I think that means that everyone will have to start redesigning their supply chain. So if you look at go back to Wuhan, that area there was supplying automotive parts for many of those larger OEMs who literally if you remember, had to shut the manufacturing line. So there were several Japanese companies that had to restrict their manufacturing line. So what does that mean? It means that we have to look at new suppliers, dual sourcing, things of that nature, Paul. So look, that brings out a lot of risk, right? Um, because you start bringing on new suppliers, that's a complete risk assessment in that terms. Uh, yes. Some of the other issues going forward is that 
look, how are we, how are we going to support our current suppliers, right? Because a lot of them are now uh, looking at going under, as you quite rightly said, look, there's no revenue, uh, you know, even employees uh, are not um, getting paid. And look, in, in terms, Paul, I think one of the things that, that we keep, um, you know, bashing through TAPRA and, and using the TAPRA standards is that 20 Three years ago, TAPRA was all about theft. Now TAPRA is all about resilience. And, you know, this is timely because in terms of resilience, you know, we're talking about making it a resilient supply chain. So we're looking more at the, the BCP, you know, the IT and even the cybersecurity pool. Um, so look, in, you know, your question on technology, it, it's OK to have, a, you know, these plans. But if we don't have the technology to support the plans, then we're going to still be in that vulnerable state. So in terms of a digital transformation, I think you'll see a rapid increase of that. You know, one of those champions have actually done one. And they are. The improvements that you can actually make to your supply chain are amazing. And in terms of your uh, visibility, in terms of managing your risk, in terms of st stopping fraudulent payments, uh, you know, it, it's a massive uh, improvement and benefit for the company. So, look, I would say to all your listeners, get involved in all those projects. Uh, you, you know, you'll have to make sure you get on those steering committees or... Um, or certainly be part of decision-making process in relation to that. You know, because there's going to be a lot of risk when we start sourcing new suppliers. Um, not only from the supplier risk, you know, the quality risk, counterfeits, you know, security of all of your, um, your, 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 your tooling drawings and things of that nature. Uh, and of course, when we start to go into new ASEAN markets, right? So we have FCPA issues, bribery issues, because we know that sometimes, you know, the cost of doing business in, in some, of the, in some of the emerging markets is difficult. Okay? It, it means that sometimes local operators will try and do things their way, right? And, uh, and, uh, and we know as, as corporate uh, organizations, uh, we don't want to even go near that. Um, so look, so those are some of the headlines that I would suggest that the listeners look at, Paul. And, um, and look, with every single supply chain, you know, this could be the time to introduce uh, a full risk management system for your supply chains. Um, and certainly that's what I've done in all of my organizations that I've worked in. From the supplier right through to the customer, I've done a complete risk assessment. And then what I've done is that where I have the gaps, I've underpinned that, you know, using TAPA standards uh, and even the ISO 28000, uh, which is the security uh, system for the uh, supply chain. So look, there are excellent tools, right, to underpin and really escalate and show these risks. Um, and look, just one interesting point pass back to you is that you know we we had a, a cyber security webinar uh, yesterday for TAPA members and you know what was brought up on that call was that your senior executive or your c-suite people are more are 12 times more likely to be targeted uh, than you know the, than the rest of us and you know what and what that what was interesting about that is trying to change the mindset of the c-suite is extremely difficult and and this is where i think you know people involved in risk management um security you know any role in terms of managing that compliance you know we've got to to raise the bar we've got to raise our game and and really highlight uh, these issues in the boardroom right and be able to get that message across and sometimes you know we know that trying to talk to us the c-level suite is difficult uh, and that's why we've when we go in there we've got to be uh, you know precise to the point uh, and get that message across clearly it, so everyone understands what the risks are and what the uh, potential solutions are. Yeah, and Tony, look, I, you know, we see it in our sector all the time. There's a lot of security specialists, but they have very limited understanding of the business, the business's needs. As a result, their reporting lines are three or four steps down from where they need to be, and that's a... Mm. That's a reflection on the industry. But look, our next session, I'd love to maybe look at a case study on digitalization next time you can afford some time because your experiences in digitalization of supply chain related factors would be fascinating. So let's try and catch up online if we if we can. If not, uh, hopefully before you go back to China and we're both co-located post uh, the circuit breaker, we can catch up face to face. But look, thanks for your time and your openness. Um, on, on very short notice. It's much appreciated. And, and I do look forward to catching up with you. Thanks. Thanks for your time today, Tony. Thank you, Paul. Welcome. Mm -hmm.